What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. And on The Stack, we talk about a couple of books that have come out this week. We review them. We lay out our opinions. And we are raw and honest about everything. Yes. We we do not suffer fools Mm -hmm. on this podcast. No. No. Well, let's talk about the first book that I loved. Fantastic Four, number 35 from Marvel, written by Dan Slott, Jason Liu, and Mark Wade. Art by John Romita Jr., Jason Liu, and Paul Renaud. In this issue, we get three stories for the Fantastic Four's enormous anniversary. And, you know, you said this on the live show, and I think this perfectly encapsulates it. Almost nobody is better at bringing the history, complicated history, of characters together than Dan Slott. And this first story, which finds the Fantastic Four going up against Kang and all of his different iterations throughout history. Of course, Rama Tut, the Egyptian version of Kang, was one of the first villains the Fantastic Four went up against, so it makes a lot of sense. But just great. Just filled me with so much joy reading this. One of, honestly, one of the best Fantastic Four four stories I've read in a very long time. Yeah, I mean... What I, I love about it is Dan Slott knows the history of these characters so well and is not afraid to shy away from, like, the pathos of it. Like, I feel like uh, Ben Grimm really goes through it here. You get to see Johnny Storm being mean to Ben Grimm throughout this, and there's a, a little through line there. And then we end up with sort of the the love of family, and the family does take care of each other no matter what the circumstances are. What I especially loved about this is just seeing all the different iterations of Fantastic Four that we've seen over the year. Because reading this, I was like, oh, right. Ben Grimm wore a mask for a long time. Johnny was dead for a while. And that got me thinking about, like, oh, Johnny dated um, Alicia for a long time. And then it was revealed that she was a Skrull. And, like, you just start to spin on all the crazy iterations. The new Fantastic Four, which was, like, Wolverine, Ghost Rider, all these other characters that were just popular then. Um there's been so much here, and to get a, just a light touch on all of it was really cool. So that story was great. Uh, one other thing that I'll actually mention about it is they break up the different Kangs attacking the Fantastic Four throughout history with throwback comic book covers, and that's yes. really fun in and of itself. Really enjoyed that. But the backup story by Jason Liu is very good and weird as they fight Mole Man yet again. Uh, and the Mark Wade story is pretty good, too. It's basically him reiterating... Fantastic Four's origin story, but with a new, more few more modern flair to it, and uh, I thought that was really solid as well. So overall, just a really, really good package, and I was very happy with this book. Yeah, really. Let's good. move on. Talk about Rorschach number twelve from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Jorge Fornes. This is the final issue of this book, tying everything up with a nice, neat bow. No questions whatsoever no questions. at the end of the day. Now, I think both of us have been very positive on this book. But what did you think about this last issue, and what did you think about the run in total? Um, I I like the the tension of this. Like it definitely, if we're, if we're charting the stakes and tension of this book over the um, the series, like it really ratchets up over the course of it to the point where um, we're here and what happens. I don't want to spoil too much of it here, but it's really well paced. Um, we get um, just focusing on the images of the tape recorder as that changes at the very end, I thought was awesome. And we don't find out really what happened. We're meant to infer some things, um, which I thought was actually cool. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're left with the same feeling that we would have had if the story was explicitly told what actually happened. Um, I think we, we know that the villain... Uh, the villains in this issue are the villains. Um, We know that our main reporter character is the one who's trying to reconcile all of this, and he does. So in that, I feel like it's more of uh, like a tonal comic about Rorschach rather than what um, you might expect of like, this is a Rorschach story where Rorschach's putting on his mask and solving a mystery. Yeah, you might even say you see in it whatever you want to see in it and Holy take away whatever shit. you want to Holy, take. Oh, <laughs> my God. Oh, wow. I got to think about this for a <laughs> The art from Jorge Fortis is great here. The layouts amazing. are amazing. Like you mentioned, without getting into spoilers, the tape recorder sequence and the way that it turns is incredible. But the big question with any project like this is, does it justify its existence? I know... Mm. We've potentially passed that Rubicon already because we've talked about 
before Watchmen and how some of those books are really good. We talked about Doomsday Clock. We've watched the Watchmen TV show and all of these other things. So certainly we're past the point where the question is, should they do a Watchmen sequel project? But the question, I think, every time out of the gate is still going to be, does this deserve to have existed in the wake of Watchmen? I would say yes, for the same reasons that I liked a lot of the before Watchmen series, which is it's really well written. The art is really good. Did it need to exist? Probably not, but it does. So I'm going to enjoy it for what it is. But curious to hear what your take is, Justin. Well, I think I would strike a difference between um, the before Watchmen books and this, because the before Watchmen books felt like they were chasing up some plot with some light theme extensions of Mm -hmm. Watchmen and sort of being like, look, here's a little bit more information. When this book, it seems very specifically to be like, hey, here are some of the ideas of Watchmen and specifically the Rorschach character who was so black and white when it came to justice and like someone needs to suffer for this crime and and updating that to our modern political world. Um, we when we talked about on our our, on our Watchmen podcast uh, based on the Watchmen TV show Watchmen Watch, uh, we talked a lot about how. Um, the politics of Rorschach specifically um, are different now. Like mm-hmm. it feels like it, that conspiracy laden mind really feels like something that has m- metastasized and has become a, a major problem in our current uh, culture and politics. And so to sort of look at that and then write this book, I think Tom King is trying to make a whole new statement um, that you can't be Rorschach doesn't work anymore. You can't mm. be black and white in this world. And so you have this character of the reporter who's going through and trying to sift through a mystery that is too convoluted and has too many tentacles to really finish. And he ends up making a choice that is a very Rorschach choice in a world that that doesn't really work mm. anymore. And I think it sort of breaks him by the end and the aftermath of what happens in this book, you sort of see this person that has almost become that Rorschach person where it's like, I can't exist in society, so I'm going to exist on the fringes. Yeah. And I I really like that. Cool. Uh, Primordial. (laughs) No, no, I agree. I think you encapsulated it really well, and I think that's well said and well thought out. I ultimately think it's going to be interesting to maybe revisit this in a couple of years and see how it works outside of the monthly comic book type paradigm right exactly yeah overall i think like i said i think they are successful at what they set out to do primordial number one from image comics written by jeff lemire art by andrea sorrentino i love this book too i'm almost hesitant to talk about it all except that it clearly exists in an alternate reality where the space programs have been shut down right after they sent animals into space we kind of find out why by the end of the issue here but it takes a wild turns and uh, the art's gorgeous of course the writing's great like most jeff lemire stuff it's this it's a heavy sci-fi idea with a light touch is what it feels like Mm. and i really enjoy that quite a bit uh that's a cool way of saying it um i mean jeff lemire it's great to just see a new jeff lemire book out there um on the stands and this one has uh has some good, it reminds me a little bit of Department of Truth in the way it's mm-hmm. sort of like, aha, did you notice this is what is happening in this comic? And uh, some mystery is set up. We don't know too much about what's happening. Um, this reminds me of a sort of more modern version of Ex Machina. Mm. Um, if you remember the Brian K. Vaughn book, which was getting some shit this week. About sure was. Its, uh, about its very sort of, blunt take on September 11th and uh, a superhero book where the whole premise was like, what if a superhero um, stopped uh, one of the towers from falling on September 11th? And there's a whole big political take on that. And I feel like that was not fair to Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, It was uh, taking a book that existed at a time where we were just a simpler people when it came to what was happening both politically and with uh, what everyone was creating at that time and try to judge it through a modern lens, which I was like, get out of here with that. It's just, <laughs> it's like why the last man uh, in the same, everyone's lumping on Brian K. Vaughn right now. And I feel like. If you want to lump on Brian K. Vaughn for anything, talk about his TV work, which has not been great. His comic book work is excellent. Wow. Sorry, Interesting he wrote take some from just a, fine. From a Lost fan. From a Lost he fan. He didn't already. add anything to that show. 
Oh, Alex, you must be two drinks in because you're saying some <laughs> crazy shit right now. I'm just telling the truth. I'm like Rorschach right now. Oh, nice. Cool, cool. <laughs> You know who's also telling the truth is I Am Batman, number one from DC Comics, written by John Ridley, art by Olivier Coppel. This is picking up off of the Batman future state here where we get this new Batman, uh, more political Batman. Uh, and this is good. It continues to be good as the other John Ridley Batman stuff has been. But the standout for me here is Olivier Coppel's art. Seeing him uh. on this Batman is gorgeous. Agree completely. The art is fantastic. This is a very... This is like a prestige Batman book, and uh, I feel like we don't quite have a handle on this Batman yet. Um, it does feel like the the Ridley book um, from Future State. If it's it's that again, but this Batman, I'm curious how he will confront more of the sort of Batman world. Um, we're just sort of getting a sense of him. He feels like he's very prepared. And we get a great breakdown of sort of the new tech that he's using, uh, which I thought was very cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm into this. I want to see where it goes. I also think, frankly, not to keep lumping on stuff, but I feel like they did a better job in this book of giving us a Batman who has limited resources than the current yeah. plot of Batman who has limited resources, who still seems to be able to do most of the things Batman does, except talk about, ooh, I just don't have the same amount of money. I only have millions of dollars and all of my friends who have unlimited resources. That's it. My favorite part about Batman is hearing about how his finances are doing. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to get a Bruce Wayne stock ticker. Just give me uh, a just give me an Excel spreadsheet in comic book form, and I'm a happy camper. Let's the talk comics is spreadsheets. <laughs> Let's talk about Eternals. Thanos Rises, number one, written by Karen Gillan, art by Dustin Weaver. This is a surprising spinoff of. The Eternals book, I guess because they have a different artist on this one. That's probably why that's going on. But it gives us an origin and revamp backstory for Thanos, or at least for Thanos' daddy. We find out a lot about him <laughs> in this book. And, and the Thanos tease... does call him daddy a lot. Yes. No doubt. And a tease of uh, what, how that potentially is going to affect the Eternals book itself. I still thought this was really good. What about you? Uh, I agree. This was... It was a lot of Eternals business, especially in sort of the front half, um, which I was like, cool, it makes sense. Kieran Gillen loves to um, really expand the the stories he's telling sort of to the sides. Once we got into the, the love story and the consequences of that from um, Thanos' quote-unquote parents, um, I really liked that, and I... Uh, I'm curious, this puts Thanos at the very sort of center of the Eternals book, which I think when I was reading the earlier issues of the Eternals book, I was like, oh, that's a fun way to inject this character we know from the Marvel Universe into Eternals, which we don't know. Um, but here it does it sort of earned that center space mm -hmm. in the book. And I thought this backstory is, it's essential reading for the Eternals series. I was surprised to see that it was in this standalone issue. I agree. Uh, now, Justin, do you ever wish you could just snap your fingers and wipe out half the pubes in the universe? Because um, I that's what I do at home. And, oh, do you? Um, I keep getting a bunch of pube Avengers who stop me from doing it. They Every fight me time. back and reverse the snap. Well, I'll tell you what. It is endgame for your pubes with Manscaped's performance package 4.0. It's like the Infinity Gauntlet. Mm -hmm. of grooming products because it brings together so many different things with the performance oh, yes. package you're gonna get tell the us about this the six stones of the of you got this the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer wait i should probably say like the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer is kind of like the space stone right the weed Good. whacker ear and nose hair trimmer sort of like the power stone crop preserver yeah. ball deodorant definitely the reality stone because <laughs> uh, there's the, a reality you got to deal with kid <laughs> <laughs> the crop reviver toner time time stone revive yep. time stone revive. Right? exactly uh Go performance back. boxer briefs i don't remember which stones i've said already and of course you get a travel bag to hold everything <laughs> all in which is very cool uh that's like the that's, infinity gauntlet there that's i uh, there that's uh, i don't know if you noticed but i noticed there were six things and that's why i said that yeah i definitely forgot one of the stones nobody called me out on it do you mean go. do you mean me? By nobody, do you mean me? <laughs> yep. I would never call out my fellow Thanks host so and friend, Alexander Zalvin. 
Really appreciate that. Now, just to mention a couple of things about these different Infinity Stones, as we were mentioning, the fourth generation trimmer includes a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Like you, you like I always say, you should have gone for the head, right? Well, in this uh, case, right. <laughs> yep. you don't you have. Do you can go that. for the head, but you'll be safe because you got the skin safe technology. And the Lawnmower 4.0 is a 7,000 RPM motor a multi-function on-off switch, and a travel lock. So if you're going across the universe to go to Earth to complete your Infinity Stones for your performance package, you can bring it right with you, and it's very cool. It's very cool. Keep your stones safe with Manscaped.com. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDED20 at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDED20 at Manscaped.com. For a clean trinity and beyond... This makes sense now. Your space balls will thank you. <laughs> Let's move on and stop blowing wind uh, out of our ass and instead talk about wind number 10 from Boob Studios, <laughs> written by James Tynan, number four. Number four. I think, that's what, I think that's what James Tynan wrote for a copy for us to say. <laughs> Let's quit blowing wind out of your ass <laughs> and let's talk about wind. The Art by Michael Dialidis. This is the end of the second book of Wind, this all-ages title that is surprisingly dark and bloody, as our main character discovers some new powers and gets a little bit of a new love. I felt like this arc as a whole was maybe not quite as strong as the first arc, even though I still really liked it, but I do think it came together really nicely in this last issue. What was your take? I, I agree with that take. It felt a little scattershot and mm -hmm. sort of introducing these horror elements. We have the vampires. This had sort of a werewolf vibe to this issue a bit for our, for Wind. Um, but I do think the I, it may be that the the tone of this book is a little different than we thought. I it felt up until this arc like it was sort of a focused fantasy fantasy story, and this feels like it's actually a much broader and like mm -hmm. sort of reaching into other genres in a way that I didn't expect at least. Um, but I liked the way it came together at the end, sort of a sweet moment for our main characters. And I'm curious, especially because of what I said, how this world will expand into the next step. Like, what's the move here? Let's talk about another ending, Wonder Woman number 779 from DC Comics, written by Michael W. Conrad and Becky Cloonan and Jordi Belair, art by Travis Moore and Paulina Ganesho. This is the end of this run that we have been loving with Wonder Woman yeah. as she travels through different afterlifes following uh, Janice, this villain who's been split from her better half. Janice, we... Janice from Friends. Yes, from Friends. Ah. Matthew Perry's character. Ah, that is Chandler, what she says. Chandler Big. No, there we go. no, that's what she said, Matthew oh, Perry's yeah. character. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was great. I was so bummed that this was the last issue here because they have been killing it on this title, but I think this tied up so nicely, and this really, in my mind, is a iconic Wonder Woman run that I would put up with almost anything else. I agree with you. Like, it, it was this... As soon as I, like, three pages into this book, I was like, oh, this is the end. You can feel the story wrapping up. You can feel all the characters being like, okay, uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all, Dead Man being like, I'm pretty much done here, I guess. Um, and to, to as it got to the end, I have her say goodbye to these characters that I thought were really great additions to the Wonder Woman canon. And I would hope that we get to see more of them. I'm going to miss Wonder Woman being able to just explore different worlds and because uh, I feel like she gets a little stuck in a lot of the runs over the past few years on just regular superhero DC Earth. So I I hope she can still bounce out and get into some places where she doesn't quote unquote belong because though that f felt especially fresh in this run. I agree. Next up, Ma, number one, from Boom Studios, written by Jude Ellison S. Doyle, art by A.L. Kaplan. This is about a bunch of women that head to a retreat that's even weirder and more deadly than Nine Perfect Strangers and the strange things <laughs> that happened there. I, to be honest, did not quite get what was going on in this book. I don't think we're totally meant to at this point. But I do think the art was very good, and that kept me intrigued enough to potentially check out a second issue. How about you? I'll go even further than you, because I agree the art was good. You don't quite know what is happening at this retreat. It feels like it's a larger sort of fantastical element we're going to get to. I'm surprised we didn't get any shades of it here in this first issue. But I really like the characters. I thought mm -hmm. the, um, the two main characters were really 
interesting. Um, a lot of bad stuff happens in this issue. Um, and I was surprised it ended on such a sort of downbeat for them. I wanted to get a little bit of a springboard into like this bad shit um, happened to us, to her, to, to her, and she is going to um, move in this direction or she's being swept up in this, in this thing that will take her to a new place. Instead, it was just like, nope, here's where we are. <laughs> Um, but again, the art was really cool, and um, I'll definitely pick up the second issue, if nothing else, just to answer sort of the questions I have. Titans United, number one from DC Comics, written by Kevin Scott, art by Jose Luis and Jonas Trinidad. This is a pretty straightforward Titans adventure, bringing together the original Titans to fight some sort of new bad. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's somebody who is powering up people and supervillains and... Maybe some heroes, I guess we'll have to see. Uh, but this feels like a nice, solid, classic Titans adventure. Thoughts? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is a, a, Titans as a whole is not exactly my thing. So I read this and I was like, yes, this is correct. Because you, you wish this. they were teens. Yeah. You prefer. You don't like when little kids grow up? Uh, if they were like teen Titans go, I'd be into mm. that. Nice. Um I really like um, the uh, Superboy here, and uh, he's definitely a focus. Um, I'm curious what it felt like a very simple, like, oh, this person has powers and they're trying to solve, to help them. And then it, it sort of started to spin in different directions. The last page reveal was a fun surprise for me with uh, the characters they um, included, including the, I'll mention the villain, Kite Man doesn't really um, appear very often outside of um, very specific Batman run by Tom King. So it's uh, cool to see him here juiced up. Um, these characters, uh, there's we don't get a lot of time with any of them. Mm -hmm. So I, and this is a limited series. So I don't know. I'm curious what the focus is going to be for this. Uh, it feels like Connor maybe, but I'm not sure. Well, I, I think that's what I'm getting at is it feels very focused towards oh, you know these characters, you know the Titans, here's an adventure with them, enjoy. And that's yeah. totally fine, but that is not my favorite mood of storytelling. I think that's sort of, you know, playing to the crowd that's coming out and doing an encore, and some people love that. I would love to see something a little fresh and new, but if you are a Titans fan, I do think you're going to be very pleased by this. Next up... Something completely, totally opposite. Man Eaters, The Curse, number three from Dark Horse Comics, written by Chelsea Kane, art by Leah Mitternick. This, I don't even know, I mean, I know how to describe this, but I don't even know how to describe this exactly in the context of the book, which ostensibly is about a bunch of kids that go to a craft camp. The craft camp turns out to actually be witchcraft camp. All of the kids go missing. Two of the kids are looking for them, including the one boy who went to camp and had no idea. He thought it was just actually craft camp. Uh, and throughout both of those first two issues, there were fun little bits where they would have badges you could cut out or little quizzes yeah. they might take at the camp. This is straight up a magazine about the camp and everything that's happened there with none of the characters, just articles and ads and letter pages and op-eds and things like that. This is great. I love yeah. that they did this. I also cannot believe that this actually came out as a monthly comic book. Um, yes, and I'll one-up you and say, I can't believe this is the third issue of this comic. Yes. This feels like an issue that comes out, like issue seven. You mm -hmm. six issue arc finishes and you're like, let's have some fun. Let's open up the world a little bit and give people like just fun, eh, f funny uh, issue um, that that goes in a bunch of different directions. And instead, this is a third issue. And I will say, this comic has been very coy with its information. So the fact that we're getting this world-expanding issue is actually helpful now. Mm -hmm. I'm just surprised that we don't see any of our main characters. And we see a lot of funny, very specific 1980s ads for um, that I read when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, uh, in your... Um, we had a catalog of, like, something like the most incredible things you've never heard of. And it was a bunch of like goofy, like prank uh, plastic stuff you could buy and it got to your house and it was broken. We ordered liquid smoke out of it when I was a kid and literally ruined the rug that changed our lives because our parents were so mad at us uh, for doing that. And this was full nostalgia feelings here. 
Um, so this is a great book to just read if you're a comic book fan from uh, from back in the day. Yeah, this book just in general is so, so good and everybody should be reading it. But as you mentioned, this is a wild, wild third issue. Next up, yeah. Wakanda, The Last Annihilation, number one from Marvel, written by Evan Narcisse, art by Jermaine Peralta. This book, as you could probably figure out, it's all the characters involved in Wakanda who are dealing with the problem of Dormammu has created Dormammu. a giant Dormammu. Dormammu has created a giant pentagram in space. This uh I really feel like I'm being very negative this week. This was kind of a mess, it felt like to me. Like I love this idea that Dormammu has created a pentagram in space and just letting demons out in space. So cool, so much fun. I don't know what was going on in this issue. Yeah, um, it was. There was a lot going on, I think, yeah. and this was sort of scooping up a lot of Black Panther continuity from uh, the Tanahasi Coates run, from um, some earlier runs. We get Storm and uh, T'Challa here, um, and their sort of relationship and post relationship. All of Storm, everyone loves Storm, which has got to be weird for uh, T'Challa to be like, she's technically my ex. I don't know what are they exes? Have they even specified exactly what happened with them? Well, they definitely did break up. I don't know what their status is, I guess, right now, maybe, but they do feel close. And like, I appreciate that. Um, I love the line over in the course of this issue. The moon is mind has gone mindless. I think it was or something yeah. like that, which I was like, yeah, a bunch <laughs> of mindless ones take over the moon and make the moon itself a mindless one. Awesome. So I think uh, for me, this this book has a lot of big ideas, but it felt a little bit like the narrative thread got lost over the course of it. Uh, but I, I appreciated a lot of what was happening. Yeah, that I think you're absolutely right with that. There were individual things, like there was a lot of stuff with M'Baku that was sort of the emotional thread yeah. of the book, which I thought was very good and very well done. I did love the Moon is Mindless thing, but it was so packed with narration and dialogue that it was sometimes hard to parse through exactly what was going on with the action. But yeah. I am still very interested to see how this wraps up. Next up, Bermuda, number three from IDW, written by John Lehman, art by Nick Bradshaw. This is continuing a journey through this strange, weird other land featuring this character, Bermuda, who is a kick-ass girl teaming up with a boy who is trying to find his sister. They may or may not be opening a portal to another world. This continues to be a lot of fun, and Nick Bradshaw is drawing the crap out of it. Yeah, great Nick Bradshaw art. Um, the story is is fun, and sort of like the last book, there is so much going on here. I'm surprised the next issue is sort of the wrap-up. Yeah. Uh, because there's been so much established, so many different factions on the island. I gotta think they're gonna bring this back for more. I would just expect to have another arc coming almost immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I assume we'll get Bermuda 2 or something like that following up yeah. on this, but th this is a lot of fun. I do really like the designs. Like you talked about, there's a lot of different things going on, but I think that's part of the cheeky appeal for me a little bit is John Layman just, well, he's throwing in all these ideas like, whoa, now there's merman and they're riding on space seagulls and, and also a portal. The yeah. portal was not, I didn't see a portal coming and then we get a strong portal at the end. Yeah, exactly. But I'm having a lot of fun reading that one. Another one that I'm having fun reading, but I want maybe a little bit more from, is Superman and the Authority, number three from DC Comics, written by Grant Morrison, art by Mikel Janine and Travel Foreman. Here we finally have our team assembled. This is Superman. He's very specific. They're not black ops. They're ops. They're out in the open. But it still seems a little vague exactly what Superman wants from them and what he wants them to do on purpose. He hasn't given them their full mission yet. But they are coming together as a team now, and they're fighting on a bunch of different fronts. This felt the most Grant Morrison-y of the issues to me, just because so many different things were happening at the same time. But the art continues to be very, very good. Yes, uh, I agree. I know it, it was. it's funny. We talked about how the getting the team together issue, last issue, felt a little um, surprising coming from Grant Morrison as like, oh, wow, he's really hitting the um, formula of a comic book here. And I think that's why, especially this issue, was like, nope, I'm not doing that, <laughs> in fact. Um, so it did feel a little, uh, a little bit of a surprising little bit. But I don't know, I guess I, to what you were saying, I don't know where the, the move is here. Right. What is, the, what is this book? 
Yeah, where does it end up? There's so many different things happening with Superman at this point. What is the goal here? And we know there is a goal, but I guess at this point we don't know exactly what it is. And hey, we'll find out maybe in the next issue. I guess we'll see what happens. That's how comics work. And I think it's working on us because we're like, oh, this is cool. The art's cool. I don't know what's happening. I guess I'll buy another one. (laughs) (laughs) homesick pilots number nine from image comics written by dan waters art by casper wingard in this issue uh i keep wanting to say our bad guy haunted house blood suit bearer but she's not even a bad guy she's just the opposing party has figured out where the main haunted house that she's gunning for is things go horribly wrong at her compound and um, this is great every issue is great the end (laughs) every issue is great and this is a book that is sort of like it's a ghost book. And they're like, ah, no, it's sort of a Voltron situation. And it's like, nope, it's a kaiju book. And then it's like, ah, no, it's just like um, Ocean's Eleven, but for ghost objects. It's like, no, it's also this. So we're cycling through a lot of genre moves, and it doesn't bother me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know exactly why. And we get just more interesting information here. It's like uh, salt beats ghosts, and uh, it's about controlling the right ghosts and hearing the little ghost stories uh, individually. Everything in this book is working, and it doesn't seem like it should be. Well, I think part of it is getting to what we've been talking about all, with a lot of these books in the stack today is Casper Wingard's art is so clear in, in the layouts and the explanation of what's happening. You could have things that could be total messes as you have protoplasm flying everywhere and blood suits and salt pills and things like that. But it's always clear what is going on in every single scene. And that helps tremendously in terms of reading the book. Yeah. And they, they, we keep getting a little nods like, Oh, we want to um, make integrate ghosts into um, human culture. And it's like, wait, what? That's a whole, that's a huge idea <laughs> to just casually drop. And maybe that's what this book is at the end of the day. Yeah. Next up, The Joker, number seven from DC Comics, written by James Tyler IV and Sam Johns, art by Gillum March and Sweetie Boo. In this issue, we don't even see The Joker at any point. It's just Commissioner Gordon maybe making a new romance with Madam Halloween. No way that can go wrong. Exactly. When I meet someone and they tell me their name is Madam Halloween, I'm like, oh, perfectly normal conversation (laughs) we're about to have. No questions. Yes, but we also get Julia Pennyworth is back at this issue in the most fun way possible. It's wild that this is a Joker book that the Joker barely appears in. Well, with jokes, you want to um, take a break and have a setup and mm-hmm. before you get to the punchline. And maybe we're gonna we're getting a long setup out of the way. To no, get punchline to is the backup story. Ah, I see. Um, I, it was a lowercase p punchline. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but I, I do like this book, and the way that James, I mean, I feel like the sands in the hourglass of James Tynan's DC work are just really running out here quickly. Um, so to take in um, the the writing in this book, which really is telling a multi-tiered story, James Gordon's story, um, sort of the larger overarching story of what this means for everybody, and like uh, the Joker side of the story that, we, like you said, we're not really getting in Joker's head at the same time is a skill, and James Tynan is great at it. Next up, Seven Secrets, number 12 from Boom Studios, written by Tom Taylor, art by Danielle DiNicolo. In this issue, our bad guys are making some big moves, but so are our good guys. Um, I think this book works best when it refocuses on the main character instead of everything else that's going on, because it's a little hard to keep track of all the different moves that are happening between these different organizations. But at the end here, we get a big move on the main mythology, focusing on our main character, the one that we've been following since issue one. And that's the part where the book really lit up for me and got me excited for the next issue. Um, How are you feeling about this so far? Stuff keeps happening this book and i like the moments but i don't know what is overarching there are too many secrets yeah there are too many secrets in this book there's seven doesn't feel like a lot of secrets too many yeah we know uh, two now yep yeah. kind but of if you if you were like name the secrets i'd be like i don't know a guy flew a little bit <laughs> no no that's not the secret one well, of the secrets see. is uh they open a suitcase and it takes out a country yes and another one shows them three possible futures i think Yes, but I would argue, like, we don't know what the secret was that destroyed Switzerland. 
Uh, well, it's a right? suitcase. We, no, we don't know what the secret is. The secret is uh, countries get destroyed. Yeah, that's not a secret. That's a consequence. This isn't what seven consequences. What if I said it like this? Countries get destroyed. Oh, hi. Interesting. <laughs> Secrets are often whispered. I'll give you mm-hmm. that. Um, so, uh, I, but I think I, I want more clarity in this book. It's starting to get hard to enjoy because I feel like there's so much happening behind mm-hmm. my back and I keep looking around and I'm not able to get my hands on it. Fair enough. Next up, The Scumbag, number 10 from Image Comics, written by Rick Mender, art by Mateus Bergara. In this issue, we're wrapping up our storyline that's been going on where uh, there was accidentally a perfect world created and then absolutely ruined by our main scumbag character and turned into scumbag world. He put together a team of reprobates to take the fight to them. They don't have superpowers, so they get destroyed absolutely instantly. Um, very fun issue, very sad issue at the same time. Well, I, w- I, I liked the reprobate stuff because I like how seriously they take themselves. They take themselves like an epic team of Avengers, and they are just instantly dispatched. I thought that was really fun. This felt like Rick Remender just going through and sort of making fun of comic book culture a little bit mm-hmm. and then expanding that sort of parody uh laser gun and aiming it at just sort of larger culture. Like we find out that scumbag's parents are just like a regular couple. And he's upsetting expectation in a fun way. This, this scumbag who we've believed to be a hero really undercuts that in this issue in a way that we're like, Oh, that's too bad. But it's like, wait, he's, a, he's the scumbag. Of course he's going to do something like that. And I think Rick Remender is just so good at toggling our mm-hmm. expectations in that way. And Last... there's a new Rick Remender book coming out soon. Wow. Did Crazy. you see that advertised in the back? I did. Uh, Guy's a machine. I, he keeps coming up with stuff. And the fact that this one feels like it's going to be specifically dealing with um, some bad uh, regular life stuff feels mm-hmm. like it's a Rick Remender book that may be the commentary that I've been looking for. Because the book is called A Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. The powerful are used to getting away with everything coming in October. Mm-hmm. Feels like this is going to be sort of an angry book from Rick Remender, which I'm excited about. Last but not least, Ninjack, number three from Valiant Comics, written by Jeff Parker, art by Javier Polito. This is continuing our adventures with Ninjack. The main draw for me here is Javier Polito's art, which is absolutely awesome. His layouts are great across the board. I want more of this. This comic feels too short while you're reading it is my big problem. Uh, Yeah, this feels like such a strong take on Ninjak. It feels like um, we're setting up Ninjak to be this sort of James Bond character. We get all these great visuals and uh, Ninjak jumping around through different uh, parts of this world, uh, secret organizations, um, new weaponry. Uh, It's fun. And the Javier Polito art is fantastic if you'd like to support our podcast patreon.com slash comic book club also we do a live show every tuesday night at 7 p.m to crowdcast and youtube come hang out we would love to chat with you about comic books itunes android spotify stitcher or the app of your choice to subscribe listen and follow the show at comic book live on twitter comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more until next time we'll see you at the virtual comic book shop and the real one look for us will there we're already. Yeah.